I love it. You guys are already on board before we even get going. That's amazing. Roger already preached a great sermon. Fantastic. Way to take away all my good material, Roger. Um, no, it's awesome. I love when uh, just we come, we have the right focus, we have the heart for what uh, we're expecting today for God to do in a great way. We're beginning a new series called The Exodus. We're not just looking only at the book of the Bible called The Exodus, the second book in the Bible, but really the theme and the story of the Exodus, which is really a theme throughout the whole Old Testament. And it's a theme that continues into our lives today. And so as we look at the story, we're going to understand this is a foundational story in the Bible. I might even argue to say that this is the foundational story in the Bible. Now, we have events like the resurrection and the birth of Christ that are foundational events. But as a theme, if we don't understand the Exodus theme all throughout Scripture, we miss the story of what God wants to do. And so I hope over these next several weeks that we will really understand the story and find ourselves in that story. I want to remind you, we have the journals available for this fall. We're beginning a new series. This is a great time to jump back into the journal if maybe you haven't been into it yet. Daily uh, Bible scriptures, uh, you know, for us to, to, you know, for you to process in your morning devotions, questions, uh, sermon notes, discussion questions here. Please take advantage of that. Um, we have more available in the, in the lobby for you to be a part of that series. So as we think about stories and we think about defining stories, we all have them. We have them in our lives. We have them in our country. Think about the United States. There's so many defining stories as, we, as you studied U.S. history, I'm sure, in, in high school and in college, and just uh, the stories that we hear from the founding of our nation to those that took risks to cross, you know, across this country and the uh, foundations of governments and presidents that we had. We think about, you know, Paul Revere, the British are coming, or you think about, you know, Washington crossing the Potomac, or you think about, you know, Abraham Lincoln and, what are you, like, Delaware. Delaware. You see, good, just checking on you. I'm German. I'm German. To give, cut me some slack here. <laughs> and I'm grateful for this country. Um, so many different <laughs> defining stories that we really need to learn better to understand our past um, than we do. Even the westward expansion, as we think about heading, you know, uh, you know, heading west and the gold rush and the expansion of, of our country and the cowboys, and as we think about this idea that has shaped who we are. We're a country that values freedom and exploration and, and, and these become a part of who we are. We have stories like that, I'm sure, in your own family, stories that are defining that you have heard from your parents, your, your grandparents, and then maybe now you're telling stories to your kids. I know the stories that my parents tell of, of, of their, you know, growing up in, in, uh, in Germany and, and crossing the ocean when my mom, when, when she came as an immigrant and a family sponsored her to come to the United States when she was a teenager. We hear these stories. We tell stories like that to our kids, how Shannon and I met on a mission trip to Costa Rica, and, and now that my daughter is in, the, my oldest daughter is at Anderson University, she's here this morning, it's great to have her here, and, you know, we'll be going through, <laughs> we'll be going through uh, to, you know, we'll be going across the campus, and I'll, I'll be telling stories, and we'll be like, hey, did you know that mom and I, and she's like, yes, we know, right? It's like, these stories, we hear them, and now I've become that person telling those stories that my kids have heard many times. But they become part of our identity. They become part of our story. We understand that our story is more than just our own experiences. It's our family. It's our history. And in faith, it's the same way. These stories that we have in the Bible, they become part of our story. Our story didn't just begin at our birth. Our story is connected to something so much bigger. In the Bible, we have these stories. Like I said, the Exodus and the birth of Christ and the death of Christ. And what do we do? Every year at Christmas, we teach about the birth of Christ. Why do we do that? We already know he was born, we know the story, but we repeat those stories. Why do we celebrate Easter every year? Why do we take communion as we remember the death of Christ and the resurrection for us, his body broken for us? Why do we have baptism as a symbol of, of the transformation that we have of being buried with Christ, being raised to new life? All these are ways we continue to tell the story that shapes us. And as we read the Bible, it's not just a book of, of history that happened disconnected from us, but it, I want us to find ourselves in that story, in the Bible, to understand this is our story, this is our narrative, and we can see not only our history, but we begin to learn something about who we are. And as we start following that story, we recognize that in that story, we see ourselves. And so it is with the Exodus, the story of, of the people of God who begin in slavery and are looking for a promised land. We have these two extremes throughout the story. We're going to hear about this over these next several weeks, that, that this captivity that they're in, in, in Egypt, 
and this longing for a promised land. And even when they reach the promised land, have they really gotten and taken a hold of all that God has for them? And so we're going to follow the story over the next seven weeks. It's going to take us all the way into Thanksgiving. And I think we're going to see and follow the ebb and flow of the people of God. And I'm confident we're going to see ourselves in that story in different ways and understand this is our story too. And when we understand it, we can understand the hope that is in the story. And so we're going to begin this week. We're going to start with captivity. Step one, part one, being captive. And so as we launch into the series, and it's going to be a great series that takes us right into Christmas, the hope that we have in Christ, and a great series we've got planned for that season as well, we're going to begin with this idea of being captive. Let's pray, and just as we start the series, ask God to open our hearts to really speak into what he might have for us today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for a time and a place where we can come and just open our hearts to our spirit, our soul, things beyond this world. Even though we're in this world, God, there's a soul in us that longs to know you, to understand and have a relationship with our creator. And Father, today as we open your word, we pray that as we enter the story, God, that we would see you and that you would show us something new in our lives, that you would lead us to a place of freedom and hope. And so we open our hearts to you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I want you, as we begin the story and we think about Exodus, I want you to picture like a movie scene, like you're in a theater. We saw a little bit already in that opener of just the sands that are blowing. Picture the desert scene. And, and so there's like, you know, a drone flying over the desert. And as the drone flies over the desert and you start seeing more of the horizon, there's, there's all of a sudden, uh, you know, just the, the green is emerging. There's palm trees and there's just a beautiful basin. And as a matter of fact, it's the Nile uh, Delta Basin in Egypt. And as you come closer and as, the, as it's flying over, you see going up a little higher, you see this beautiful city. And it has these magnificent buildings and temples and, and, and stonework. And you're thinking, man, there's, there's some opulence here. There's wealth here. What an amazing, beautiful place. And as the, as the, the drone comes closer and as the footage takes you in, you hear these sounds of, of hammers chiseling away at stone and, and these, these magnificent buildings being built. And you're going, wow. But as you get closer even, you start realizing that this isn't just people and workers, that these are slaves. There's taskmasters here that are driving these, these workers and driving these construction projects, and people are laboring under heavy burden. And then as the, the camera kind of goes past the city and the beautiful buildings, you see houses, hundreds, thousands of them. And you see it's an encampment, and this is where the slaves live. This is where the, 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 these families and these children live in a whole different way and a whole different um, culture. And the place that we're looking at and what we're seeing is Ramses in Egypt. And the people that are the slaves are the Israelites, the Hebrew people. And what we understand as we look at this, and maybe if you look at Scripture and if you understand that in the Bible, the Hebrews, the Israelites, were the chosen people, the people of God, the people, the nation that God chose not to make them special in the sense that this is only unique to them. They were to be God's light to the world. The way that the world understands who God is, he was going to show them what a relationship looked like with his people. And he was going to bless them to be a blessing to the world. And they were going to be his instrument and his vehicle to do that. And here they are. These people are now working as slaves, building an empire. And you wonder, and go, how did we get here? What happened? How did the people of God end up in this place? Didn't God promise them the promised land? The promised land is a theme throughout the Bible. It's a theme throughout the Old Testament, this idea of a place that God had set aside. And we have to go all the way back, back to Abraham. When God told him, he said, I'm sending you, I'm going to you know, go to a new place, a place where I will establish you and my people, and it will be a place of rest. It will be a place flowing, as the Bible says, with milk and honey. I don't know if that still sounds good to us today. Maybe it's a place flowing with coffee and donuts. <laughs> Maybe that would be more appealing to us, you know, or wine and filet mignon. I don't know, what, you know, whatever your speed is. Somewhere between those, I'm sure, something will grab you. But it was this, this place that, that was just going to be a place of abundance, a place where this nomadic people could settle down, and Abraham goes there. And then through his son, through, through Isaac, and through Jacob, and they began in this beautiful place to begin to lay down roots. And you go, to, how did they then get from that place? How are they stuck in Egypt as slaves? What happened? And so we read the Bible, we read in Genesis the story of, Jacob, uh, of Joseph and his brothers. 
Jacob um, was Joseph's father. They had a lot of sons, and if we recall the story, or maybe you think back to uh, your childhood and and remembering Joseph being sold into slavery, or maybe you've seen Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, however you know the story, Joseph is sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers, and in his time there, he goes through incredible hardships, is thrown in jail, and eventually he rises to power as second in command, and, and Pharaoh put him in that position because he was anticipating a time of famine, and sure enough, a time of famine happened, but Joseph prepared Egypt well for this time, and so now Joseph is in Egypt, and his brothers, they come from the land of Canaan, and they come uh, to find food. And there's Joseph reunited with his brothers, a great story and message and to, for another day. But in a beautiful way, Joseph reconciles with his brothers. And not only do they reconcile and his food provided, Pharaoh tells Joseph, provide for your brothers a place to live. And so he gives them land, and all of a sudden, these brothers who become the 12 tribes of Israel... Where are they located now? Egypt. They're in Egypt. And so it begins. This is where they begin now to, to begin to set down their roots, and they begin to live their, their lives in that way. But where's the promised land? It's hundreds of miles away to the north. It's not there, and yet they settle there. And even throughout the book of Genesis, at, even at the very end, Joseph, as one of his final dying wishes, says, take my bones with me, with you, when you go to the promised land. There's this idea, there's this hope that even though we're here, this isn't the ultimate destination. There's another place for us, something else that God has in mind for us and for the people. And that was the promised land. And then we open up the pages to Exodus. And the Exodus begins, and now 400 years have passed. And you know where the people are still at? Egypt. It's hard for us as Americans to comprehend what 400 years of history looks like. A nation where we might say, you know, we're 200 some years, you know, uh, in, coming up on 250. Uh, But we have to go back to like Jamestown, like back to the 1600s. I mean, it's hard to imagine. But this is how much time has elapsed. And in the meantime, what we begin to read in the pages of Exodus is that leadership has changed. Pharaohs have come and gone. And it says the new Pharaoh didn't remember Joseph. This amazing legacy, all that happened. He, he He forgot all about that. And the people, they had multiplied. They had the, the Israelites had multiplied and had children and families, and actually the king feared them. He feared that if another country came or a neighboring army would attack, that they would revolt. And so what he had to do is he had to enslave them. He had to put them to work and put tight guards on the Egyptians. And then this is what we read in Exodus chapter 1, how the situation had shaped up. Exodus 1, 11 to 14. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. So here's the context. This is where we begin the story of Exodus, where we see the people in this situation. And I might say here that Egypt is what happens when power corrupts and when sin is embedded into a society. This is what happens. And you know what? We don't have to look back far, do we, to have to see this at play in our world right now. It may not always look like slavery in this form, although we have that experience in our past, in our nation people oppressed, people held captive against their will, forced to do labor and work. We see it, whether it's through human trafficking today, whether it's through child labor, whether it's the wars that we see, whether it's in the Middle East today or whether it's in Ukraine and Russia. There's so many times where where there's just this power imbalance and there's struggle and we see it everywhere and it's brutal and it's difficult and there's victims and there's people who are being oppressed. And the Israelites understood that. And so this narrative in Scripture has become a hope and a source even throughout our history and through individuals when we're stuck in captivity. What is the hope? And so this is how the story begins. And I want to focus on a couple of verses now in Exodus chapter 2, beginning at verse 23. It says this, Years passed, and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. And something just caught me with that, that simple phrase, years passed. 
And as we've talked, and as Roger mentioned in worship and throughout the series, I want you to think of your own captivity. What does that look like? And how can it be that all of a sudden years pass? Has that ever happened to you? And you look back and go, how did we end up here? What has happened to the years? This was never the plan. This is never what I intended. And somehow you're in a place where you never thought you would be. Maybe it was a job relocation, or, or you said, you know, I'll take this job for a while, we'll just see, you know, I'm young, I'm free, I can go and do, you know, different places in, in this world, and all of a sudden you realize 20 years have passed and you're still in that place. Right? It can happen. I think about a place where, where we lived in Arizona, it was Florence, Arizona, on the far southeast part of the Phoenix Valley, I mean, really uh, almost halfway to Tucson, and we knew some people there that have been around for a long time in that city, a smaller town that was up and coming and, and, and growing. And uh, they were telling us the history of Florence and how it started. And the way it began was that there was a family that was actually on their way to the promised land, California, right? They were, like so many people, they were making their way out, right, to the, to the mountains and the sea and the gold and whatnot. And they were making their way through Arizona. And it was a family that had four boys. At least this is, at least this is what we were told. And uh, the, they, they came over on, on wagons, right, covered wagons and these wooden, you know, they had the wooden wheels and whatnot. And so this family had, had four boys, and in order for, you know, one of the worst things that could happen was a wagon wheel to break. And so in order to keep the wagon wheels from breaking, they assigned each one of the boys to take care of one of the wheels to keep it from breaking. And the way they did that is they would, um, when it was time to relieve themselves, they would moisten the wheel to keep it from breaking. You guys don't do that with your car tires to keep them from drying out? They got to about Arizona, the wagon wheels were doing just fine, and all of a sudden one of the wagon wheels broke, and what I was told, it was the wagon wheel of the youngest boy. <laughs> he didn't have quite as much to keep it from breaking. The wagon wheel breaks, they settle there, and that became Florence. They, the family settled there, they built a town, they didn't continue on, and that is the history of Florence. They didn't intend to end up there, and sometimes through crazy circumstances, that's how they now find themselves. And so I think we look at ourselves, we look at our lives, maybe physically we're in a place we didn't think we would be, but now we're here. But so many times settling and being in places happens almost imperceptibly to us. It can happen in just such small ways. And, and now don't just think physical, uh, in physical geography terms. Think about spiritually, emotionally, the places we get to in our head, the places we get to in our heart, and almost imperceptibly we get there and go, how did I get so comfortable in my sin? How do we get so comfortable in this dysfunction? How is this now what my life is? Is this just who I am? Or things that happened, you know, actions that you take and you think is no big deal, maybe it was just, you know, innocent flirting and, and now it's become a full-blown affair. It was just, you know, social drinking, but now it's full-on binge drinking. Things you never intended to look at, but now it's a full-on porn addiction. There's things that we go through and things that we deal with and go, how did we end up in this place? Spiritually, the drifting that takes place. You know, I'm just going to skip church a few times, and, you know, it's not, faith isn't all about church. You know, faith is more than going to church, but all of a sudden you realize you're not being regular, you're not going, and all of a sudden you're finding you're drifting. You're going, how did I get here? Why don't I care so much about my faith? Why am I not so alive in my spirit? What's going on? We drift, we fade. Sometimes it's things in our past. It's not just the things in our present, but we, maybe there's a past abuse that took place, and you are still held captive by that very action, and it can be years that have passed. Maybe it's something you did, and there's great regret. There's guilt, and there's shame, and you, it's still defining you. You're going, how can I continue to live there? Maybe it's trauma, something that you went through that's continuing to shape you today. Somebody asked me in the last week or so, how long did it take you to get over what happened to you back in, back in Arizona, a tough thing, transition I've shared with you at different parts in time? I said, you know what? It took almost five years for that to just really not have any more poison or bitterness or sting. And I go, how did it take so long? Some things in the past can hold on, and, and for some it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, things that were much worse than that, that maybe that you're dealing with, and you go, how did I get here? Maybe it's abandonment that you felt from somebody or a parent or a friend. And these things become places where we live in the shadow of that pain. And we go, this is not what I imagined my life to be. This is not the future I thought I'd be living. And yet, we're settled and we become captive in that space. And what happens? 
And what happened to the Israelites is like you begin to lose your dream. You begin to lose your hope. I guess that's never going to happen. I thought that was just a dream when I was younger. Maybe that's what I thought marriage was going to be or I thought what my career was going to be. I thought that's how my faith was going to be. I thought I was always going to be on fire for God. And now I don't even know that I want to spend any time with him. And you go, what happened? And you lose the hope. You lose the dream. You lose the vision that was there. And I wonder if the Israelites got to that point. What was this whole talk about promised land? All these years, our father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, what were they talking about? 400 years, we're still slaves, we're still stuck. Like, is that promise true? God, is that really real? Is that ever going to really happen? Or is this just my lot in life? Is this how it's going to happen? And they look around and they say, freedom, that's not possible. Look around, have you seen Pharaoh's army? <laughs> Have you seen the chariots? Have you seen the horses? We're poor slaves. There's no way we can ever escape. This is our lot, and we feel stuck, and we feel captive. What do you do? What do you do when you're stuck? What do you do when you feel captive? What do you do in your relationship with God? What did the Israelites do? Did they complain? Did they protest? No, they didn't protest. They didn't fight. They didn't curse. They didn't boycott, at least not the things that we read about in the Bible. But here's what it says in the very next verse, in that same verse after it says the years had passed, right, and they were still under the burden of slavery. It continues here. It says, they cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. The cry. They cried out for help. Let me put it this way. When you are at your end, the best thing you can do is cry out to God. Sometimes we don't need to be told that. That's just sometimes a natural response. When you're at your end, sometimes we think it's like the last and the worst thing. Sometimes I think we ought to be crying out sooner to God, but they come to this place where they have nothing else to do. They can't. They're stuck. They've tried on their own. They've tried to beat the addiction. They've tried to get over the trauma. They've tried to get over the past. They've tried to get through the depression. They've tried to get through the struggles. Everything on their own, they can't. They're stuck. Maybe you are too, but they cry out to God, but the cry is a beautiful thing. Now that I don't have a, I'm not a parent of little ones, I, sometimes I hear a baby crying, it's like, ooh. But as a parent, right, you, you dial into that. And you hear that cry and you respond. And the cry is something that connects you. Cry, the, the cry of the child is a cry saying, I need help. But we're too proud as adults. We're too proud as men. We're too proud as, you know, adults in our, our lives, accomplished females and women. And we say, we don't need help. And there's something about this moment where they cry out to God. The cry is important. Have you ever read the Psalms? If you look through the Psalms, the honesty of coming before God and not just being, oh, Holy Father, thou art. To be honest before God. What's going on? What are you feeling? Look at Psalm 130, verses 1 to 2. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call to you for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Can we talk to God like that? Did you ever feel like that? Lord, what's going on? Don't you see the struggle I'm in from the depths of despair? Come and do something. To be honest with you, maybe you can relate. It's in the times where things feel the worst in my life that I seem to have the best prayer life. <laughs> it's not a beautiful prayer life, but it's maybe one of, God, where are you? God, what's going on? God, when are you going to answer? How long, God, is this going to go on? But somehow, actually, in those difficult times is when the connection can be some of the strongest. It's when things are going well that sometimes we're like, I got it now, God. I don't need your help anymore. But to cry out is a powerful thing. One more here, Psalm 22, verses 1 to 2. See if this might sound familiar to you. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call out to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. If I were writing the Bible and trying to encourage believers, I might like, let's, let's, let's edit this one out, right? Let's, because, you know, like we don't want to admit that sometimes we don't you know, feel like God doesn't hear us or we feel like God's far away. The honesty, that's there. And who used these very words when they were in the depths of despair? Hanging on a cross, nailed to a place, captive on a cross, unable to move. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It doesn't mean that God did abandon them. But it's speaking honestly that we feel abandoned. We feel in a place where we are stuck, where we can't get out. But our cry is what connects us to our Heavenly Father. Just the fact of crying out to God says, I trust you. I believe in you. I believe you're still out there, God. I need your help. And the cry is a powerful, beautiful thing. 
After the cry in verse 24, it says this, God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A simple verse, but a reminder that God hears and God remembers. He hears you. He hears that cry. He hears that call. His ear is not deaf to you and your situation. And he remembers. He remembers what he promised you. He remembers the the plans, the things that he has birthed in you, the things that he's given you. Maybe it's been years and you've almost forgotten them yourself. God does not remember and forget his promises. He remembers those very things. And then the next verse said this says this, he looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. Now, this isn't when God woke up. <laughs> it was like, oh, 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 you guys are, you guys are in slavery? I, I got to do something now. It wasn't like this was like, oh, I finally heard you now. No, this was the time. In God's timing, it was time to act. And it didn't mean that he just started in that very moment, but something's been happening. And this is one of my favorite parts of what I'm going to talk to you about today. God is working behind the scenes. As we look at this next verse here, it says, in verse 25, it says, he looked down on the people, it was time to act, right? But here's the thing, just because you don't see it or feel it doesn't mean God isn't already working on your behalf. You need to hear this again, I mean, just slow this down, right? Just because you don't see it or feel it doesn't mean God isn't already working on your behalf. And so what the nice thing is about scripture is we get to sometimes step back from a story that if we were living in real time, we wouldn't know what was going on. It's just God, we're stuck in slavery. But God had already had a plan. You know what his plan was? To send in an octogenarian for the rescue. Sounds like a great plan, doesn't it? Could you imagine Rambo, 80 years old, going in? You guys remember Rambo? I mean, dating myself a little bit. This was God's plan. Moses was 80 years old. <laughs> Remember, Moses is a big part of the story. Now, you know, there's great wisdom to be had uh, the older you get. Those of you here among us that are in your 80s, my parents, right, others, it's, a, it's powerful. But it's not maybe the first thing you think about when you think about freeing slaves out of the captivity from a nation like Egypt. But this was God's plan. It was a plan that had been in the works for 80 years. How do we know that? Because of what the Bible says. Because of the story. So let's rewind the story a little bit. We think about Moses, and, and, and in this time where the, where the Israelites were growing and expanding and the, and the king was there, he was, the Pharaoh was threatened, and what did he say? He, he threatened and said that he wanted to execute all young boys under a certain age. And so what did the, the Hebrew women do? One of the moms created a, a basket, a wicker basket, and put tar, and, and what she do? She laid it in the Nile River, so to keep the baby quiet, to keep him from being killed. And so there's Moses lying in this, this basket, floating in the river under the watchful eye of his sister in the distance, and the princess, right, the daughter of Pharaoh, finds the baby as she's there on the Nile with her attendants, and she, she opens the basket, and there she finds this baby, and she wants to begin to raise it with the help of his actual birth mother. And you know what she calls this baby? Moses. You know what Moses means? To lift out. To lift out. She lifted him out of the water. What a beautiful, it sounds, it sounded like that in the original language. And so this idea of what a beautiful name. We lifted him out of the Nile, but little did she know, little did Moses know, little did Miriam know, little did the people of Israel know that it was going to mean so much more than just lifting a baby out of the water, but that he was preparing Moses to lift the people out of a much greater captivity. And this was the promise, and this was what God was already working in the middle of the people struggling and moaning and groaning. And and here's the thing, Moses went through his own captivity. As he grew up in privilege and in Pharaoh's household, as as an Israelite himself, as a Hebrew, this conflict that he had in his own spirit, I'm sure, with seeing his people and yet having privilege. And one day it boiled over when he saw one of the slave drivers beating up one of his fellow Hebrews, and he killed him. And now he was under threat of Pharaoh, and he was running for his life, and he fled into the desert. He was a a fugitive on the run, a murderer. And he went hundreds of miles into the the wilderness and wasn't seen for years or heard from. And God began to develop something in his life, and, and he was there, and he got married, had a family. Until one day he's out, and he sees this burning bush on a mountaintop. And this bush is burning, and it doesn't seem to be consumed. And out of curiosity, he goes, and he wants to see what is there. And as he's there and he's seeing this, we get a 
an image now, a picture. Of, he comes before God. He takes off his sandals. He's standing on this holy ground, and God speaks to him. And here we read in, in, um, in Exodus 3. It's like we get the, the, the curtain is, is, is pulled back, and we get to see now while the people of Israel are, are struggling and complaining and, and or crying out to God, here's what's happening in a distant place with Moses up on a mountain in, in Exodus 3, a few verses. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. You see, you may not see it. The Israelites didn't see it. They didn't know, but there was something going on while they were crying out that God had been preparing for 80 years for a man out in the wilderness, in the desert, in the mountain, telling him, I've seen, I've heard, and I've got a plan, and I'm about to execute this plan. I'm going to set it into motion. You may not see what's going. You may not feel it, but God is working on your behalf. I think about the time in our transition in, in Arizona from the church we were at, and it was a season of, of waiting and listening and, and healing. And I remember thinking, and Shannon and I going, well, what's going to be next? What church or where? We were ready for ministry again. And sometimes there were great periods of silence where we didn't hear anything. We go to God, what next? What now? And I remember being um, at a soccer game in December. That's what we do in, in Arizona, in Phoenix. Beautiful day, December. I get this call from a bitter person in Ohio because of the cold. No. <laughs> um, it was a member from the search team. And I remember an I answered my phone and said, it was a gruff rougher voice. Hello? <laughs> it's Mark there. This is Mark. Hi, I'm George Golding. <laughs> George Golding. Yeah, let's talk. Meadow Park. And, what it, and it began a process, but it reminded me that in that moment, in that moment before I heard that call, there had to have been conversations beforehand. It wasn't like George just randomly called me. That even while I wasn't hearing anything, while I wasn't knowing anything, there was a church that was praying. There were people that may have been circulating my name, looking at my resume, or looking at things of that nature. Unbeknownst to me, God is working even when we don't see it. And there may be something happening in your life right now that you don't see, but God is working out on your behalf. Somebody sent me an email and had this quote in it from, from one of our favorite pastors, Joel Osteen. Everyone knows him, right? He said this, the fact is that God had the solution before you had the problem. That's a good statement right there. The fact is that God had the solution before you had the problem. So it's not a new thing to God, but what is God doing behind the scenes for you? If God's plan for your life is for you to be married, maybe he's preparing a future spouse unbeknownst to you right now. Maybe there's a job that's already being formed. Maybe somebody's talking about you at their company and they're going to reach out to you. You don't even know it at this point. Who knows what God is, is working behind the scenes and, and is trying to, to move in your life. Maybe it's a best friend that you haven't even met yet. Think about that. A person you don't even know could become your best friend. A mentor you haven't even met yet. Somebody that comes along just at the right time. You don't even know it yet, but you're going to read something this next week. Or you're going to open a Bible passage that's going to speak to you in a certain way. Or a message that God's going to use. We don't know. Or maybe it's a hard time. Maybe it's something difficult that you're going to go through, and God's going to use that because of a plan that he has for you. And Moses wasn't sure either in this moment how this was all going to work out. And his question, his big question was, um, who am I? God, who am I to do this? I'm not capable of this. The question isn't who am I. The answer lies in knowing who is I am. Now you need to read that a couple more times. God said, ah, Moses, don't worry about who you are. I am. That's how he referred to himself. I am. In the present, always in the present, always in the now, the God that was, the God that is, the God that always will be, I am is sending you. We focus so much of who am I? I can't get myself out of this mess. Moses couldn't be the deliverer on his own. The people of Egypt couldn't get out of their captivity on their own. Who is? We need to focus on God. The Bible says I lift my eyes into the hills. Where does my help come from? Stop looking so much into your own situation. This is what happens to all of us when we're in these captive, stuck, burdened times. We get like this, right? That's all we can see is this moment we're in, the thing we're stuck in, the thing we can't get out of, and we just spin our world in this, and we get stuck there, and all of a sudden the years pass, and God's saying, lift your eyes up. Raise your cry. 
Where has your help come from? Who is I am? Then Moses returns to Egypt, and, and God gave him his brother Aaron to help him. And here come these two old guys to Egypt. They gather the people, and here's what we read in Exodus chapter 4. Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything the Lord had told Moses, and Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron. When they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, what did they do? They bowed down and worshiped. Were they free yet? They're still in captivity. They're still in the same situation they're in. But knowing that God has heard the cry, knowing that God wants to deliver, they bowed down and they worshiped. It's what Roger was talking about earlier. Can you worship? It's in worship that chains break and that freedom comes. And so how do we understand our captivity? If we're going to begin this journey together, we have to understand we're captive. Where are you captive in your life right now? Let's not just think about, oh, the Israelites and metaphorically out there, but personally, where in your life do you feel like something is holding you back, something is holding you captive spiritually, emotionally, physically? Something you just can't seem to break free, and maybe even years have passed. So I want to end with these four things. How do we begin our exodus from captivity, from these very things? Four things here. First is this, confess. Admit that you are stuck. This is where all transformation happens. All things spiritually happen. When we come to that place of confession, this is, God, I am stuck. I'm finally admitting that I've either gotten myself in this mess or somebody else has put me in this mess, but I'm stuck and I can't get out. Whether it's spiritually, emotionally, I need help. I can't get out on my own. And you don't have to be there. You don't have to settle in that place. That, but you just say, God, I'm stuck. You confess. That's confession. Lord, I've sinned. This is, what I've, this is, this is where I've gone astray. And that begins an acknowledgement of saying, I'm captive. Something's holding me. The Bible talks about sin holding us captive, that we are slaves to sin in our lives. What is it that you feel in your life? Confess that. Admit that you're stuck. The second is this. Cry out to God. Surrender. Right? There's freedom that comes from finally saying, God, I can't do it on my own, but I surrender to you. I need you. And it's this crying out to God and to recognize God hears our cry. And be honest as we read in the Psalms. Just be honest in that. Here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm going through. Here's what I'm dealing with. God, hear my cry. Confession, surrender. And the third is this, trust. Trust that God is already working behind the scenes. Don't lose hope. Don't think that the situation you're in is the end. It's where it's always going to be. It's never going to change. It's never going to be different. Trust that God is not done yet, that he's working behind the scenes, that there's a hope, that something is on the horizon. Picture it. Remember it. What is it? And if you've forgotten it, ask God to birth something new in your spirit that you can see that there's a new day ahead of you. And God wants to lead you into that promised land. And the fourth is this, have faith. In the meantime, worship God. It's a great worship song that says, you give and take away. You give and take away, but still my heart will say, blessed be the name of the Lord right? It's, it's in the midst of our captivity. It's in the midst of the struggle. And if we want to find freedom, if we want to move from captivity to exodus, to promised land, and begin this journey, let's do like the Hebrews here. We cry out to God. And when God begins to answer, and God, we recognize God hears our cry, we respond in worship. We say, God, thank you. And as a foreshadowing of this whole series, it wasn't Moses who was the deliverer. Yes, God used him to lift the people out, but God was going to send another deliverer. And every week throughout the series, it's a constant reminder that there's another deliverer, one who lifts us out, and that's Jesus. Jesus is the one who lifts us out. When we think about baptism, right, and you're going underwater, what do we do? We're being lifted out of death, lifted out of the grave, brought up to new life, and that is the hope we have in Christ. And salvation doesn't start when it's all worked out. Salvation doesn't start when we're in the promised land. Salvation doesn't start when, you know, sometime in the future. Salvation starts when we admit and confess and we say, God, I need you. I surrender to you. I trust you. And in that moment, you're on a new path. That's the path to salvation. That's the path to freedom. That's the path to life. And it's where the journey begins acknowledge your captivity before God and say, God, I need you. 
And in this moment, let God come in. And over these next weeks, as we see how God begins to deliver and in the powerful way that he does set us free. Listen, we all get stuck in places. And God continues to come back and say, I want to free you from that. I want to lead you into a new place. Let's close our time together and just ask you to bow your heads. What captivity have you maybe been in and it's already been years later? You've just become friends with it. You've just maybe even accepted it and said, I guess this is just how it's going to be. God has something new for you. God has something better for you. God has a place of rest, a place of freedom, a place of hope, a new future. Don't give up on that. Invite God into that very place today. Say, God, I need you. I cry out to you. Call on the name of the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, in a room like this and those listening online, God, there's so many different things that hold us captive in our life. Satan is there trying to hold us back, trying to grab our heel, trying to pull us back down. Father, let's not let him give that, have that foothold on us. But Father, break us free. And though we may not be able to see and even know how you're going to lead us out, Father, today we just cry out to, to you. We call out to you, God, save us, rescue us, hear our cry. We trust you, we worship you. Father, today, I pray that this would be a new beginning. We take the first steps towards freedom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.